Howdy y'all. Today we'll be having the last episode in our series on the main tanks of World War II. This topic will be covering the French, Japanese, Italian, and Commonwealth tanks, which are the colonies or the properties that aren't the mainland of the United Kingdom. That's what that is, just in case you aren't familiar. This will be the last episode in that series. These will be kind of the minor country tanks. This is the last episode in that series. We'll be focusing, we'll still have episodes on tanks and equipment and that sort of thing, and military history and so on, but I'm going to be refocusing the Kentuckian, as I mentioned in the last episode. I'm very excited about that. I hope that you'll uh, stick around to see some of that. If you are interested, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with everything that we, uh, that I at the Purdue Kentuckian are producing, excuse me. Now, let's get to the tanks, because I'd say that's probably why you all are here. The first tanks that we're going to talk about are the French tanks. The first French tank that I want to talk about is the Char B1. Now, this was one of the heavy tanks produced by France before World War II, and France had a lot of tanks, to be clear. They actually were one of the countries before the war that had the largest number of tanks. But... They weren't necessarily great tanks, we'll, we'll explain. So the B1 bis, or the B1, uh, there's a few variants of it. One of them is the Char B1 bis. The B1 was generally armed with a hull-mounted 75 millimeter howitzer with a very limited range of motion. So it was hull-mounted, so it couldn't spin all the way around because it wasn't in a turret, but it also didn't have much side-to-side -side movement either. Uh, kind of a disadvantage there, but it was a 75 millimeter howitzer and it had a small one-man turret that the commander, who also served as the gunner and loader of the 47 millimeter gun, uh, served in, and that was a middling gun. It, it wasn't, I mean, it, it wasn't very good. It wasn't absolutely just horrible and useless, but it wasn't good. It was very well armored, though, for early in the war. Actually, in the Battle of France in 1940, German tanks, generally armed with the the weaker. 37 millimeters or 50 millimeters uh, and the maybe short 75 millimeters that we've talked about already in the German tanks video were uh, they had a very hard time trying to penetrate the Char B1. It was a very well armored tank. They had a hard time dealing with it. However, the B1 was expensive. It was slow and it was complicated. So while it did have an advantage in just straight on combat against early German tanks, any other case, it, it struggled. So a tank that was in some ways good, but really wasn't great except in combat and due to the, the nature of the war it was fighting did not serve well uh, in stopping the German advance. Another tank that was quite heavily produced by the French was the Renault R35. Now, I do want to make a quick note, and this will be the case with some of these countries, and I'll mention them when they come along. The French had several other kinds of tanks and armored vehicles that they used. As I've mentioned before, I believe very early in this series, the general idea is to hit the main tanks. So the tanks that tended to serve a lot, or there were very many of them produced, or perhaps that, as we'll see with some examples later, they were the only examples or of domestically built tanks. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more later with some of the other countries. So the R-35 was heavily built very heavily produced tank actually it was an interwar tank and it was designed as a light infantry tank so they the french did use the term infantry tank similar to the way that the british did uh, in world war ii and in the interwar period and it was designed to replace the renault r ft-17 now the ft-17 was a tank from world war one france still had a few ft-17 units equipped in France at the start of World War II because they hadn't been able to retrain and re-equip all the units that they wanted to. Despite the fact they started building the Renault R35, the replacement, in 1936, even four years later, the French hadn't managed to retrain and re-equip all the units that had the Renault FT-17s. The Renault R35 had decent armor, and that's one thing that appears to be a bit of a trend with the early war French tanks. When you look at them compared to the guns they were going up against, against Germany and so on, their armor generally was okay, but that was also about the only thing they had going for them most of the time. The Renault R35 is the other main French tank was very slow. It was designed as an infantry tank, so speed wasn't very important. It had a very, very weak short-barreled 37 millimeter gun, and it was one of those things, it, it was obsolete basically when it was on the battlefield. And what effect it did have, even though it could withstand some hits, its mobility, it's the fact that it was very slow meant that it couldn't be used very effectively. It's slow enough, it can't respond to the fast German offensives, and 
there were many of them captured and reused as with the the char b1 but as a tank in their intended role the role they were designed for they did not really serve all that great they had armor that was about it that they had going for them the french still the free french forces so basically the forces that left and that was a, a large portion of the military and, and some of the navy and so on and so forth and resistance fighters uh, to a certain degree fell into that i believe but that's sort of a that's a separate issue so the free french forces didn't have the ability to produce tanks they aren't even in their own country anymore so while they used a lot of armor they used american and british armor mainly american from what i've seen so that's the thing there had a lot of tanks but they were mainly tanks we've already talked about next is the japanese now there's only two tanks with the japanese i'm going to talk about again there's other tanks that they had and that they used but nowhere near the numbers of these two that we're about to talk about and the first one is the type 95 hago the hago was a fairly heavily built japanese light tank it really wasn't great but it served okay in its jungle role and that's one thing about the japanese i'll explain a little bit more but it the hago was a small tank that in the circumstances served pretty well although it was poorly armored its gun really wasn't sufficient. It had a 37 millimeter that didn't work well against American tanks, uh, but it was mainly effective because it was small and because it could manage all-terrain travel. It <laughs> Basically, at any point in the war, the tanks it would have been uh, facing, it would have stood very little chance against, but the thing about the Japanese is they weren't always fighting tanks, and I'll explain more in a minute once we talk about the next tank, which is the Type 97 Chiha. Now, the Chiha was, again, one of those more heavily produced tanks of the Japanese, and it was also the most effective tank that the Japanese employed, actually put into combat during the war. It was considered a medium tank, although it was still very small by most countries' standards, and it was better than the Hago in, in like every way, basically. It had better horsepower. It had better armor. It had a 47 millimeter gun that was far better than the 37 millimeter that the Hago had, although... By mid to late war standards, the 47 millimeters still struggled against basically anything it would go against. But really, even though the Chiha was basically the best tank the Japanese fielded during the war, <laughs> it still could basically maybe hold its own against the M5 Stuart. So Shermans and any other tanks, T-34s that they might come across and fight, they were severely underclassed. The Japanese tanks have a very bad reputation, and in some ways it was deserved. Their tanks were basically always riveted, they had poor guns, they had poor armor, they, they were very primitive designs compared to basically, well, even a lot of early war designs, but especially mid and late war tanks, and the Japanese never deployed or fielded any better tanks than that. Well, there's a little bit more to it. The Japanese, for one, had limited tank production capacity. Japan being an island, and most of their fighting being done in the Pacific, the Navy played a far, far more important role so what happened was when it came to tank production is it basically got the the back end of priority those tanks actually serve pretty well now that's assuming they don't come across enemy armor they actually did produce some other tanks that would have performed better but the japanese wouldn't deploy them they kept basically all of those tanks in reserve for this imagined final battle that they would have on the mainland of japan against the allied and against an allied invasion kind of an interesting thing with the japanese tanks they aren't they aren't as bad as they're often given a reputation for in context against other tanks they're horrible but against the forces they often fought especially early in the war they did their job now let's talk about the italian tanks we're only going to talk about one tank for italy and it's technically i guess three tanks it's the m13 m14 m15 and there's usually like 40 41 and 42 after each of those that's really a series of tanks and it's the only tank that the italians produced in significant numbers the m13 was the earliest model the 14 and the 15 were continually upgraded models but this was a series of tanks that struggled even at the best of times uh, the armor and the engine was made better on the M14 series, but it was never enough to deal with the guns that the Italians were facing. The 47 millimeter gun that the M that the M series that we're talking about was fitted with was never enough to deal with the tanks it was going up against, really, except for in the early war. And however, even though the gun might have done well and the armor not not good, but comparable with other tanks of the time in the early war period at that point 
poor discipline, poor deployment, poor, poor training and experience on the part of Italian crews meant that even when those tanks stood a little bit of a chance, they were basically ineffective or mostly ineffective. The M15 was another all-around upgrade from the M14. It had a slightly better 47 millimeter and it had better engine, better armor and so on, but it just wasn't enough. It was too little, too late. They never served well and they were obsolete, honestly, almost as soon as they were deployed. The Italians did have, as with uh, the Japanese and the French, have some other vehicles. They had a few other tanks and self-propelled guns, but none of them served fantastically or were produced in as heavy of a numbers per se. They simply just, the Italy didn't have the production capacity. The Japanese had it to a certain degree, although they still riveted a lot of their vehicles and so on, which we've talked about before, it was a very poor design choice. But they did have some capacity. The Italians just never really had the capacity at all. The Japanese didn't necessarily prioritize tank production. The Italians couldn't prioritize tank production, really. And uh, it was a very big problem. They had a few other designs that they were never able to really implement that might have done okay. There may have been a handful of prototypes built, but nothing to really matter. And by 1943, they had surrendered. And if they used tanks, they were probably using Allied tanks. So... Interestingly enough, they also used captured tanks, but one of the big ones that they used was the Renault R35. Um, Hitler had given kind of a gift to the Italians of, of several of these R35s that they captured, and they served just about as bad or maybe worse than they did with the French, not surprisingly. And now finally, I want to talk about Commonwealth tanks. And this, I actually have three tanks we're going to talk about here. But uh, the first one is a Canadian built tank called the M4A5 Ram. Now, the Ram was sort of a Canadian experiment for a home built tank that was armed with the British gun on the Sherman slash Lee chassis. There were actually over 2,000 of these vehicles built, but none of them saw combat in their Ram tank form. You could think of the Ram as a slightly better version, slightly worse version, excuse me, of the Sherman, but the chassis and the Ram itself, so like the hull, actually did see a lot of combat because there were many variants of the Ram that were built. Uh, flamethrower tanks, armored uh, personnel carriers, armored recovery vehicles, and so on, and they did see action that way, but the actual tank form never saw combat. It was used a lot for training uh, because what happened was they realized, hey, we can get plenty of Shermans. There's no reason to basically build a whole nother vehicle. Let's quit producing the Ram. We'll use it for training. And well, let's focus on vehicles that are more standardized than even the Ram. It is, as I mentioned, you can think of it as a slightly worse version of the Sherman, although it never was in combat. You can probably assume it would have been a little worse than the Sherman, probably not much. And considering this was the first tank that Canada ever built, it was actually a, a pretty, pretty good uh, product, especially because they didn't have experience designing tanks before. I want to very briefly mention, I'm not even going to show pictures of it because it's basically one we've already seen, the M4 Grizzly. Now, the M4 Grizzly was just the Canadian-built M4 Sherman. There were very, very few differences between it and an American Sherman. It had mainly interior modifications. It was fine. Again, it looks basically just like an American Sherman, very slight differences, but they did produce them. And the last tank that I want to talk about is the AC Sentinel, and AC stands for Australian Cruiser. And so this was an Australian cruiser tank that they built. And by the way, I do want to mention the Ram was also considered a cruiser tank. But anyway, back to the Sentinel. This was an Australian built tank, and this was their first real attempt to build a, a, a domestic tank. It was also built or designed for the Sherman slash Lee chassis, and it probably would have served well as a medium tank. It had decent armor, and while it was designed to take the two pounder or the six pounder gun. They never built them with the six pounder. They were only built with a two pounder, but considering the Australian tank probably would have mainly served in the Pacific, it would have been dealing with Japanese tanks, which we've already talked about, uh, were not very well armored. And the two pounder probably would have been able to deal with anything it would have come across in the Pacific. Interesting tank. It was actually in a lot of ways, again, a decently designed tank, but it never saw service. There were only about 65 of them built and similar issue they realized they could they could get shermans available they could get allied tanks available and they basically just said we don't need the sentinel they stopped producing it and unfortunately the sentinel 
uh, did, unlike the the uh, Ram, excuse me, was never used. So the Ram, they had the vehicles, they used them for several different things. The Sentinel, they basically just put into storage and were left to rot. And it's interesting because even though they had the two pounder, they never had the six pounder, they did experiment putting the 17 pounder on the Sentinel. But the funny thing about it, just a little funny story, the 17 pounder was a big gun like we talked about in the in the the british video and it had a lot of recoil it's a very powerful gun but at the time they started trying to figure out if they could mount a 17 pounder on the sentinel they didn't have any 17 pounders available so what they did was they mounted two 25 pounder howitzers onto the tank to simulate the recoil that the 17 pounder would produce so they just mounted two big howitzers on there to try and get the same recoil to see if they could make it work so these unique Commonwealth tanks were definitely better attempts at tanks than some of the others we've talked about. They just ended up being not needed. Superior and more available tanks took their place. The, the few Sentinels built, again, basically just put in storage to rot. There are a handful still around today in museums and such, but unfortunately that was the fate of the Sentinel, which I think is a very cool, in general, a pretty cool looking tank. Anyway, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this episode. That'll bring this episode to a conclusion. Hope you found it informative and a bit shorter than normal. And if you'd like to support the Kentuckian, don't forget about our social media. There's plenty of ways you can keep track of what's going on and, and help increase our reach. Don't forget to hit that like button and so on and subscribe if you'd like to keep track of what's going on with the Kentuckian. And if you'd like to support me in a more personal way, my Patreon is also listed in the link below in the links below with the social media as well. And remember, friends, as long as you and I are doing what's right, we make a real difference in this old world. This has been Ryan Dalton of the Kentuckian, signing off.